today. We're going to talk about trees. What do we know about trees? What do we know about trees, David? They give you O2. They do give you O2. They give you oxygen. That's right. What else about trees? They uh, help the earth. They do. They surely do. What else? That's true. That is true. What do we else we know about trees? What else? No, she said sometimes they give you the stuff you put on pancakes. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. That is true. I like that. I like that. What else? They were, made they were made by God. And that's exactly, exactly right. Now, I thought about that. Oh, you got one more for me? Look what I've got in here. What have I got in here? Leaves. I've got leaves. I've got leaves. What have I got in there? I've got leaves. Well, this, that side over there was real. And this side was not. But I want y'all to get a leaf. <laughs> now, that's a real one. We're going to put it back. Now, get you one. Get you a leaf. I want everybody to have a leaf. And that way we're going to get you a leaf. I want y'all to get you a leaf. That one's real. That come off my tree at home. That's something. That, yeah, get you a leaf. That's a real leaf. Yeah, get you, get you one. Up. You want this shiny one? Yeah. Okay. You want that one? You want a red one like David? Okay. What are we seeing as we drive down the road a lot this time of year? We seeing leaves? Okay. Oh, you hey. do. I love that one. This is my thought. Oh, that's a real one, definitely. They come off my sycamore tree at home. And you know what I thought about leaves, too? Look how pretty they are. That would come off my dogwood tree. That would come off my dogwood tree. And I bet you all know what this is. That's an old one. That's an oak. We've got a lot of oaks around here. That's an oak one. That comes off of the oak trees. It surely is. But they all have names, don't they? They all have names. Have you thought about how we're like a tree? Each of us are different. We're all different sizes and shapes, different colors, used for different things. Hey, Declan, you still thinking about it? Okay, you still think about it. But I thought about that, and then we had the point that we were all created by God. What happens now if our roots aren't real strong on a tree and a storm comes and the wind blows? What happens? They fall down, don't they? They fall down. Sometimes they're uprooted. Sometimes they just break and have to fall down. They fall down. That's what happens. That's what happens. My granddaddy always told me a tree is only as strong as their roots. Their tree is only as strong as its roots. And our scripture, give me just a minute and I'll be right with you, Patrick. Our scripture comes from Jeremiah 17. And this is what made me think about this. It says, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. They never stop producing fruit. But the key word I wanted to think about there is planted. When you plant something, guys, what do you do? Um, it, 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 it grows and grows and grows and grows. And you plant it with what? Water. A point, a plant, and a purpose. Have any of y'all ever just went out and just dug a hole and threw a tree in? I'm not saying I haven't done that, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's good if you plan... It's good if you think about the future, and it's good about if you think about how tall that tree's going to get. But usually it's a point planting the purpose when you plant a tree, isn't it? And I like how God said that. I like how God said that. He said he planted a tree. Jeremiah. A few things trees need are sunlight. That's right. And we need the same thing, don't we? We need the same thing, and God provides that for us. Yes, oh yes, absolutely just beautiful. Absolutely just beautiful. But I want you all to think about that as you take a look at the trees this week, how we are planted by the rivers of water and how God takes care of us and how we're all unique and how much God loves us. Yes. You do? Oh, good. That's good, sweet precious. Absolutely good. Okay, we got any other thoughts? But we're going to be like trees this week. Okay. I've had to be a lot of trees. You do? Well, cool. I think that's cool. Does anybody want to say the closing prayer for us? No, don't have any volunteers? Okay, well, let's bow our heads and pray. 
Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for these children, dear Lord. And as we go out through this week, let us just be the salt and the light, dear Lord, that we're called to be. Let us act like trees this week, dear God. Let us stand strong and be strong for you. All these things in Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Good job, guys. Good job. Okay. You can keep your leaf if you don't want to. You can put it back in there. You may. You want to keep your leaf?
but why do we do that? So let me ask you a question. Why are you here this morning? Hmm. Now, I know the bad answer. It's Sunday morning. We always go to church on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. But can I just help you remember something? If you're here just because it's Sunday morning, you're here for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're here just because of something you've always done, we're here for the wrong reason. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be blessed, but I am saying we're here for the wrong reason. We're here to worship. But what I want us to understand something is this. Y'all are going to have to pay close attention, okay? Don't, don't want to let your mind wonder. Hmm. How we live Monday through Saturday is going to affect what takes place on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. You see, if I worship Monday through Saturday, you worship Monday through Saturday, then when we come to the house of God, we're going to have an experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I want you to remember and learn from this today is this, is worship is a lifestyle, yes, not a place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Now, before I, I get into it, I want you to know there's several reasons why we, why we worship and why worship matters. But I, I want to just remind you about something, okay? When we come into the house of God, just a few things I, I want to talk to you about worship. <coughs> Did you realize that everything that we do here is to be worshipful? Really? Yes. But we've got to be careful. Because if we're not careful, we can get into a routine. When's the last time you made announcements at the end of the service? Hmm. You see, we, we become passive. We, we become ritualistic because, guess what? We know exactly how everything's going to happen. Would you agree with me that we don't even need a bulletin some Sundays because we know exactly what's going to happen and how it's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And sometimes if we're not careful, what we do is we make it so rich that God doesn't have the freedom to intervene. Mm -hmm. You see, this is God's house. We're God's people. And God ought to have the authority and the right to intervene right. and change it. Number two. Every element in the service should be an expression of exalting God. Even our announcements. Do you realize that, that our announcements, that we are promoting activities that are going to promote the kingdom of God? Right. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we do this, we need to take serious thought about our announcements and how we do them. When I was pastoring full time, I used to always take my announcements and I wrote them completely out. People would know why. And said, because when I stand there, I want to make sure that I know exactly what I'm saying and I want to do it in a way that is honorable and pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. Number three, worship is not necessarily synonymous with music. And he said, what do you mean that, Brother Larry? Well, see, we can sing but not necessarily worship. Mm -hmm. You see, worship is far more than just singing. Worship is far more than just preaching. Worship is far more than just giving tithes. A lot of times people think, well, if we sing, then, then we worship. That's not necessarily true. But I want you to notice also, too, that worship right here is flexible. Now, now what do I mean by that? I may worship one way, you may worship another way, but the key is, is it honoring to God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God may move on you to raise your hand. Guess what? That's okay. It may be for you, it may not be for anybody else. But you know what? When God leads us to worship, you know what we need to do? We need to do what God is leading us to do. And people, beloved, when God is leading us to do something and we don't do it because we're afraid of people more than being obedient to God, what we do is we grieve the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. If God's leading you to worship in a way back there, my friends, listen, you be sure that you do it. This morning, the psalmist writing Psalm 95 is writing there and he's 
exhorting the people to whom he is writing to remember something. And he's encouraging them to praise God, but also to look back upon the previous generations that was called, that was brought out of the land of bondage and it was going into the promised land. But if you remember the story that they got there and they sent the spies in, and what did they do? They came back and they said, we can't go up there. He said, those people are like God. We're like grasshoppers in the eyes of those people. We can't do it. You remember there was two there that said, hey, we can do it, but 10 said we can't. And those 10 negative, what did they do? They affected the whole crowd, and therefore they chose not to go up there. And you remember what God did? God left them in the wilderness. But even before you get there, you remember that God's bringing them out. God has provided everything they needed. He brought them across the Red Sea. And you remember they get there, and there's two places, Meribah and Masa. Masa. They're in the desert. And they come there and they're thirsty. And you remember the first one up there is that, that God provided water for them up there. And then the second place, God speaks to Moses and he says, go there. And he said, just, he said, speak to the rock. Well, what happens is Moses is dealing with probably uh, two point, uh, over two million people there at this time. And he's probably tired and angry and upset. The people have been grumbling and griping. And he's just worn out. And when he goes there, instead of doing what God told him to do, to speak, what does he do? He takes his rod and he says, you know, that I and Aaron are going to bring forth the water. And he strikes the rock. The rock comes, uh, brings forth water. But God tells him because of that, he says, you shall not enter the promised land. So God is writing, you know, the psalmist is writing here. Here's what he's trying to tell people. Don't tempt God. Remember God's faithfulness and praise Him. Now join me in reading this psalm this morning, uh, if you will, Psalm 95. The psalmist says, Come, let us sing to the Lord, sing for the joy to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In whose hand are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days of Masa in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said there are people who err in their hearts and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger that they shall not enter into my rest. Father, we, we thank you today, that God, that we can read your word and, and God remember who you are. And Father, be encouraged to worship you as God, as we remember God, your faithfulness. God, we can stop and each one of us look back, Father, over our lives and see how it is that, God, that you have blessed above and beyond measure. And how, how, God, that you have protected. And so, God, we want to today just spend a few moments, Father, just reflecting on worship and, Father, God, what it truly means. Father, to you, God, may you be honored and glorified in your time here today. I ask you, Father God, please, to cleanse me, to forgive me, and God, speak boldly through your people today. God, your people have come, God, not to hear anything that I have to say. But God, they've come to hear, God, what it is that you have to say. So today, just... Father, give this into your hands. And just as humbly as I know how, God, let not your word return unto you, Lord. But may it accomplish that, God, which you desire for your glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 You, you say, little Mary, does worship matter? Worship matters, my friends, because God matters. And when we often talk about worship, we often refer to it as in the time in which we gather right here. But 
what we fail to realize is this, is that worship is not just a place. Worship is a lifestyle. Right. In other words, we gather here on Sunday mornings to kind of get our batteries recharged. And we're going to leave out of here and we're going to go into a world. And that world is going to be watching us, whether we're at school, whether we're at our workplace, wherever it is that we go, my friends, listen, people are going to be watching us, they're going to be listening to us, and we need to be an example. We need to be the shining light to the whole world that we are children of God. Right. And what we do as we do this is we are worshiping. And so we've got to understand how to worship. Without worship, without worship, our lives will be filled with religious activity. Mm -hmm. We'll come to church on Sunday, we'll give money, we'll be active, but we'll miss the one thing that we were created for. Mm -hmm. If I could ask you this morning, do you have any idea why you were created? Well, we all have a purpose, brother, let me know that, but let me tell you why you were created. According to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it asks this question, what is the chief end of man? And here it is, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Mm. Wherever we are, we are to glorify God in all that we do. Mm -hmm. And we are to enjoy Him forever. Can you say, that today is sweeter than the day before. Mm -hmm. And our prayer should be that tomorrow would be sweeter than it is today. Every day with Jesus ought to be sweeter than the day before. Mm -hmm. you, you see, we are to thoroughly enjoy Him. And when we think about that word right, worship, there's so much that we can say about it, but one of the words there in the uh, New Testament for worship means to bow down. That, that is that we come into the presence of God and what we do is we literally bow down and we give Him the praise that He deserves. It is to give God the honor that is due Him. A best, a, probably one of the best ways to understand worship is to flip over to the book of John, chapter number 4. And if you remember right there what's happening in John chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples are taking a journey. And uh, they're outside of the town called Sakaar. And Jesus is there. He's sitting by a well. And, and as Jesus is sitting there, all of a sudden there's a, a lady that comes there. And she begins to draw water from the well. And she begins to draw water from the well. Jesus asked her for a drink of water. And she says to Jesus, he said, who are you? to ask me, a Samaritan, for water. Now, you got to understand something. This goes deeper than just a Jew asking a Samaritan for water. This was a man asking a woman mm -hmm. for water. That was something that was not done in that day. Mm -hmm. But here it is. She's here. She's come probably at the hottest part of the day because of her lifestyle. And so as she is there, Jesus now begins to engage her in conversation. And he begins to say to her, he says, now give me a drink of water. And then the woman says, who are you to ask me? And Jesus said, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me. And she's confused and she says, how can you give me water when you don't have anything even to draw water with? And Jesus looks at her and he begins to explain to her. He said, well, if you knew the water that I was going to give you, it is living water. And she said, give me that water. But Jesus, before we even get there, Jesus has to get her mind in the right way. Look with me there in verses 19 and 20 of this passage right here. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. 
And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship. You see, Jesus is wanting to engage her in her lifestyle and her sinful condition. But what she wants to do is she wants to change the subject. But no matter how hard she tries, Jesus is not going to let her change the subject. And in verse 21, he tells her, he says, you can worship anywhere. You see, in that day, he said, there's coming a day when you'll worship neither of these places. And these were very revolutionary words at that particular time. It was revolutionary for them, but very comforting for us today because, you know what? What Jesus is saying to us, you can worship him anytime, any place. Mm -hmm. You can worship him right here. You see, worship is not tied to a specific place. Now, as you look at those verses we've just read, let me give you three simple statements, right, if you will, okay? Number one, God is looking for worship. God is looking for people who will worship Him. Isn't that amazing? But you realize that every person worships something or someone. Mm -hmm. You were created to worship. You see, there's a God-sized vacuum inside of every one of us. And if that vacuum isn't filled with God, and the things of God, you will find, try to find something that will satisfy that vacuum there. But I want to tell you what, it doesn't matter what you try to fill that vacuum with, it will never, ever be satisfied. The only thing, the only one that can fill that God-sized vacuum in you is God. Amen. That's right. And you see, that's why it's important for us to make sure we have a relationship with Him and that we worship Him. Number two, our worship must be in spirit. This is, uh, in the present tense, meaning that God is continually scouring and searching for those who will worship Him in the right way. You say, wait a minute, brother, what do you mean in the right way? Well, you see, true worship is in the spirit. We can come here and we can sing and we can give and we can do all those things, but it has to originate within our heart. It has to originate within our spirit. And when we come here, we must focus on Him. You see, God is a spirit, and because God is a spirit, then we too must worship Him in spirit. You see, genuine worship is spiritual. To worship in spirit means to give your heart's full attention to God. If you come to worship and you're distracted about everything else, you might be going through the outward ritual, but you are not worshiping in spirit. Mm -hmm. How easy it is for us to get distracted mm -hmm. and take our focus off God. Mm -hmm. Do you know that Satan will use anything to get you distracted from why you're here. Mm -hmm. He will take anything to get you distracted. When I was in Mississippi, I was pastoring the church there, and it never failed that during the invitation time, there was a young man. And it never failed that what he would do is he would take a step right out from the pew that he was in, kind of like in the aisle, and he would take his hand and he would reach it in his pocket and he would begin to jingle his keys. He's probably two-thirds back of the congregation. I'm standing at the front and I can hear him jingling his keys. Now you say, well, Brother Larry, that doesn't make a big deal. Listen, if it distracts someone, mm -hmm. it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And what we've got to realize is this, is that my entire focus, my entire being is simply focused on God. I'm not worried about what we're going to eat for lunch. I'm not worried about what activities we're going to have this afternoon. I am simply focused on 
God. It doesn't matter how who the speaker is. It doesn't matter how well he's doing. My friends, it's about God. Right. And when we come with the right heart attitude, what we're saying is God speak to me. Mm -hmm. I don't care if the pastor wonders. I don't care if he stutters. I don't care who he is. I don't care anything about that God. What I want you to do is God, I want you to speak God to me. That should be our heart's prayer. Mm -hmm. That we come desiring Him. And worship must be in truth. You see, this Samaritan woman had it wrong. Mm -hmm. She thought it was about a place. <clears throat> it wasn't. It's not about a place. It's about a person. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, that's what Christianity is all about. That's what worship is all about. It's about worshiping. Now listen to this. It's about worshiping the right person the right way. Right. Yes. If I'm going to worship in truth, then I must worship Jesus as the Bible declares him right. to be. Yes. It is not, he, Jesus is not who I think he is. He is who the Bible says he is. Right. Amen. And I must be yeah. willing to worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. And would you agree with me that there's times when the truth hurts? Right. Amen. Amen. But when we are truly worshiping and we are making ourselves available to God, to God to simply say, here I am in God as I worship you. God, I want you to speak to my heart. Mm -hmm. Yes. God, whatever it is that God, you need to say, God, whatever it is that you need to do, God, would you, God, please yeah. do it. Right. God, tell me the truth. You know what? Because it is the truth that sets us free. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm going to take just a sidebar here for just a minute. Okay, so hang with me. One of the greatest things they've done for us at uh, our school was in the gym, they put cameras up out there. And so when somebody messes up, you know what I always do? Is I take them and I put them right over there. And I said, I want you to look. And I point. I said, you see that point over there? Yes, sir. I said, you see that black thing? Yes, that's a camera. And I said, you see this thing right here? Yes, sir, that's a camera. And I said, you see that thing over there? Yes, sir, that's a camera. And I said, they can see my thing again right down here. I said, I'm going to ask you one time. Did you do it? Now, if you don't, we're going to go to our office and look at the camera. Did you do it? Those cameras have gotten the truth out of kids more than anything else. <laughs> it was hard for them to admit the truth. But we always tell them, when you tell the truth, the punishment will be near as hard. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, hearing the truth hurts. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to be the children that God wants us to be, my friends, listen, we must worship Him in truth. That's and that's right. not just here, but that is wherever it might be. We have to worship Him, listen, in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we can't become too emotionally attached to one or the other. It has to be balanced. John Piper says, truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy and emotion without truth produces empty frenzy and cultivates flaky people who reject the discipline of rigorous drop. True worship comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love deep and sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. I want you to notice something about the, the heart of our Lord and Savior here. When he encountered this lady, he knew all about her, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He knew about all of her husbands. She t he told her how many times she'd been married. And then he said these words to her. He said, the man that you're living with is not your husband. Here's what I want you to say. Jesus knew all about her, but he still went seeking her. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know what? He was still mm -hmm. seeking sinners right. today. Mm -hmm. 
I hear so much in our world today about this seeker friendly stuff. Okay? And I hear people say, Well, I was seeking the Lord. Now, don't mean to make anybody mad, but let me just be honest with you right here, okay? You didn't seek the Lord. Mm -hmm. I didn't seek the Lord. We were running from the Lord. Mm -hmm. We would still be dead in our sins and trespasses had God, through His Holy Spirit, not come seeking us. Mm -hmm. My friends, listen. When God gets after you, that is an uncomfortable thing. And the tendency of human beings is to run from God. But it is God in His love for you that sends His Spirit after you, that calls you, that saves you. And today, I want you to understand something. God is still seeking sinners today. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. You see, worship is in spirit and in truth, and it is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So if I could just kind of sum up this for you, just a minute, let me tell you what it is. Worship is not... Worship is not limited to a place, but it is an expression of adoration to a personal God within the parameters of spirit and truth. Mm. So now, let me do it. When we think about worship, we make worship oftentimes about us. Don't take this the wrong way. A lot of times I already don't have enough sunlight to hurt you. But, but don't take this too long, but okay. Well, we get worship wrong. Because I hear people sometimes, and they come up to me and say, man, you, you just hit the nail on the head. Or you just really spoke to me. But hear my heart. You see, worship's not about us. Worship is about God. Right. Mm -hmm. Soaring Turkey said this We had the mistaken notion on a Sunday morning that a performance is taking place. The minister is the actor, God is the prompter, and the congregation is the audience, deciding whether they like what happened or not. And here's what he said Actually, what takes place on Sunday mornings is that the congregation be the actors, the minister, the prompter, and God. The audience. That's right. Mm -hmm. Here's what he's saying. You see, God is the audience. And God is seeing and hearing everything that's taking place. That's right. mm -hmm. And here's what you and I need to ask ourselves. How did I do today? Mm -hmm. Did I actively worship? Mm -hmm. Did I give God glory and honor? Mm. Mm. The key is this. Is God honored with our worship? Mm. Mm. And when we worship, when we worship, Are we giving him our all? Mm. Do we give him our full attention? Now, guys, y'all probably will probably get upset with me because y'all just going to have to steal with me anyway. But I would say you're happy, okay? <laughs> but, you know, sometimes, guys, when we're singing, we just sit there and we don't say a word. I hear, I hear people say something like this. I just can't sing. I can't find anywhere in Scripture where God says we don't need to sing if we got a great voice. <laughs> the Bible says that God inhabits the praise of His people. Yeah. And there's nothing that I believe that God loves more than seeing His children sing <coughs> and praise Him. Mm -hmm. But that is why I'm on you. Let me just go ahead and get all the way out there, okay? <coughs> Not only does God desire to see him, praising him in song. But there is nothing more that you could do to show your children 
Mm -hmm. How much you love God mm -hmm. that let him then see you saved. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we walk away from the day, here's my prayer. That we walk away hungry. Mm -hmm. I read this this week and it took me for a while. But hit me hard. And this has been my prayer all the time. Tommy Kenny wrote this. He said, God whispered this to me during a life changing Sunday morning service. He said it was a divine encounter that forever imprinted itself with indelible ink on the pages of my memory. He said, while he was sitting there doing a service, that God whispered to him and he said, Your favorite worship services and my favorite worship services are not the same. He said, God whispered to him, he said, you leave your services full and satisfied. But when you leave, I'm still hungry. There were tears in my eyes when I whispered to my wife. I don't think I've ever been this close to him before. I wish I knew then what I have discerned since. That God will leave our meetings full and satisfied only when we begin to leave them feeling hungrier for him mm. than when we first came. Mm. Wow. Mm. Did you get that? Mm. You want to you wanna please God? You want to honor God? You want God mm. to be honored? And when we say our prayers and we, let's, and we leave here, there's nothing to worry about the time. Let's leave away hungrier for God than when we came in. Right. And I'll tell you what it will be then that God will be pleased with us. That's right. Mm -hmm. Father, today as we come to the close of your service, I just pray that Father that it is that exactly pleasing and honorable in your sight. Father, I may have rambled and wondered, but I just pray that despite it all, that God that you have been honored and glorified. And the Father, that there is a hunger that is knowing inside of us that said, Pastor, tell us more. Teach us. God, would you God, show us more of yourself? God, make us hungry for you. May we be like the sons that said, as the deer pants after the water, so my soul pants after thee. God, may we walk away today, God, hungrier than when we came in. It's my prayer that I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother, what number were we? Amen.